As the Civil War began, Hatteras Inlet, which lay between Hatteras and Ocracoke Islands, was the most traveled and vulnerable inlet on the Outer Banks. Soon after the firing on Fort Sumter, Confederate soldiers and enslaved people began building two sand forts at the southern end of Hatteras Island to defend the Pamlico Sound. Those defenses were mostly manned by members of the 7th North Carolina troops, led by Colonel William F. Martin. Hatteras soon became a principal port for southern privateers, who took dozens of ships and cargo worth millions of dollars. In search of an easy victory and under pressure by insurance companies to shut down the privateers, the Union Command authorized the first joint military operation of the war. Benjamin Butler, the commander at the time, brings two regiments, the 9th New York and the 20th New York, down here with about four ships to take Hatteras, which seems to be an easy opportunity. There are two sand forts here, Fort Hatteras and Fort Clark, that guard the northern part of the Hatteras Inlet, one of the three inlets through the Outer Banks that are navigable to ships. The Union ships will come here in the late August. The Union troops will attempt to land. The 20th New York will land pretty much in total. The 9th will land one company until all their ships, all their landing ships will break up in the surf. Stuck here on the island with more than enough Confederates to take them on, the Union troops hunker down while the Navy bombards the forts. So on the 29th of August, the second day of the fight, the Union Navy gets close enough to try to pummel the two sand forts. Fort Clark surrenders without a fight and in fact is abandoned, but Fort Hatteras fights on. Fort Hatteras was defended by about 700 Confederate soldiers led by Colonel Martin and under the overall command of Samuel Barron, a naval commodore with the responsibility for defending North Carolina's coast. The garrison was joined by Confederates that had retreated from Fort Clark, which was less than one mile to the northeast. The Union Navy will try to push forward and make their guns more effective as they get closer to Fort Hatteras. Unfortunately for the Navy, that's when they're going to find out why this is called the Graveyard of the Atlantic. The flagship, the USS Harriet Lane, will actually close distance and run up on a shoal that wasn't on their maps, under the very guns of Fort Hatteras. Now the Confederates have the Union troops at their mercy, the Union gunboats right where they want them. And unfortunately for them, at this time, Commodore Barron and the generals decide now is the time to surrender. They run up the white flag, surrender to Union authorities, and the Union troops will take the rest of the island all the way up to Hatteras Lighthouse, 15 miles from here. The taking of Hatteras Inlet was a morale boost for the Union and was one of its earliest victories in the war. The locale also would provide a base for future operations in the area. President Abraham Lincoln, roused from bed in the middle of the night to receive the news, reportedly danced a jig in his nightshirt. <laughs> 